So we are reading uh, Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. We are on chapter 21, page number 191 of the book and page number 206 of the PDF. Breathing and posture exercises to charge and open the chakras. Levels 5 to 7 of the auric field. The most powerful exercises I have seen to charge up the auric field, brighten it, clear it, and strengthen it are those taught by the Kundalini Yoga people who focus on position, breathing, and spine flexibility. I would recommend that you learn them directly from a Kundalini ashram if you have the opportunity. If not, I have simplified some of what they teach to add to this book. These are shown in figure 21.3. Chakra 1. Sit on the floor on your heels. Place the hands flat on the thighs. Flex spine forward in pelvic area with the inhale and backward with the exhale. If you like, use a mantra with each breath. Repeat several times. So we'll see the uh, sorry, we'll see the uh, pictures a little bit. Chakra two. Sit on the floor with your legs crossed. Grab the ankles with both hands and deeply inhale. Flex the spine forward and lift the chest. Rotate the top of the pelvis back. On exhale, flex the spine backwards and the pelvis forwards near your sit bones. Repeat several times using a mantra if you like. Chakra 2. Another pose. Lying on back, prop yourself up on your elbows. Raise both legs about one foot above the floor. Open legs and breathe in. As you breathe out, cross legs at knees, keeping legs straight. Repeat several times. Slightly raise legs and repeat again. Do this until your legs are about two and a half feet above the floor. Then lower them following the same procedure. Rest, repeat several times. Chakra three. Sit with crossed legs, grasp the shoulders with fingers in front and thumbs in the back. Inhale and twist to the left. Exhale and twist to the right. Breathing in long and deep. Make sure spine is straight. Repeat several times and reverse direction. Repeat again. Rest one minute. Repeat entire exercise sitting on the knees. Chakra 3, another pose. Lie on back with legs together and raise the heels 6 inches. Raise the head and shoulders 6 inches. Look at your toes. Point to your toes with your fingertips, arms straight. In this position, pant breath through your nose to a count of 30. Relax. Rest for a count of 30. Repeat several times. Chakra 4. Sitting up with legs crossed, lock fingers in a bear grip at the heart center, elbow pointing out to the sides. Elbows move in a seesaw motion. Breath long and breathe long and deeply with the motion. Continue several times and inhale, exhale and pull on the grip. Relax one minute. Repeat sitting on your heels. This raises the energy higher. Be sure to tuck in your pelvis. Chakra 5. Sit with cross legs, grasp knees firmly. Keep the elbow straight. Begin to flex the upper spine. Inhale forward. Exhale back. Repeat several times. Rest. Now flex spine by shrugging shoulders up with inhale and down with exhale. Repeat several times. 
Inhale and hold 15 seconds with shoulders pressed up. Relax. Repeat the above exercises while sitting on the heels. Chakra 6. Sitting with crossed legs, lock fingers in bare grip at throat level. Inhale. Hold your breath. Then squeeze your abdomen and sphincters and push energy up as if you were pushing toothpaste up out of the tube. Exhale the energy out the top of your head. As you raise your arms above your head, holding same bare grip, repeat. Repeat sitting on your heels. Chakra 7. Sit with crossed legs with arms stretched over the head. Interlock the fingers except for the two index fingers, which point straight up. Take an in-breath by pulling the navel point in, saying, sat. Let the breath out, saying, numb, while relaxing the navel point. Repeat in rapid breaths for several minutes. Then so this is sat nam. Okay, sat nam. Take an in breath by pulling the navel point in, saying sat. Let the breath out, saying nam, while relaxing the navel point. Repeat in rapid breaths for several minutes. Then inhale and squeeze the energy from the base of the spine to the top of the head by squeezing and holding the sphincter muscles first and then the stomach muscles. Hold your breath, then let it out, maintaining all muscle contraction. Relax, rest. If Satnam does not feel right for you, use a different mantra. Repeat sitting on your heels, rest. Repeat without using the mantra instead. Take short, fast pant breaths through the nose. Chakra 7, another pose. Sit with crossed legs, hold arms up at 60 degree angle with wrists and elbows straight, palms facing up. Pant breathe through the nose with a rasping breath against upper back part of the throat. For about one minute, inhale, hold the breath and pump the abdomen in and out 16 times. Exhale, relax, repeat two or three times, rest. Shivangla, just show the diagram first. Next page. So these are the uh, postures. Sitting straight and then bending back. In this case, pushing it out and then pushing it in. Over here, lifting your head, raising your feet and then turning them around. Niche jaw. This is again twisting, but keeping your elbows up. Twisting and keeping your spine straight. Over here again, you are pointing your hands, raising your head and pointing your hands towards, the, uh, towards your toes. Gripping your hands together and moving it in a seesaw motion. Gripping the hands tight, very tight. Then again, pushing it up and down with your hands on your knees. This is with your shoulders. You're pushing your shoulders up and down. This is again raising your hand, holding your grip. This is putting it up and pointing it up. So again, simple exercises. This is something all of us can actually do. You can go back, Shivanga. Color breathing meditation to charge aura. With your feet parallel and shoulder width apart, slowly bend and unbend your knees. Each time you bend your knees and go down, breathe out. As you come up, breathe in. Allow yourself to go down as far as you can without having your heels come up. Relax your arms. Keep your back straight and do not bend forward. Allow the lower half of your pelvis to jut forward a bit. Now stretch your arms out in front of you, palms down. 
Add a circular motion with your hands to the up and down motion you are already making. Your arms are stretched out as far as possible on the upward motion. As you reach the top of your movement, bring your arms into the body, palms down, and allow them to remain close to your body on the downward motion. At the bottom of your movement, again, stretch your arms out. Add a visualization to this movement. You will breathe in colors from the earth up through your hands and feet and in from the air all around you. As you breathe out, you will breathe out the colors. Breathe each color several times. Start with red. When you reach the bottom of the next movement, breathe in red. See the whole balloon of your aura fill up with red. After you reach the top of your movement and begin moving down, breathe the color out. Now try it again. Can you see the red clearly with your mind's eye? If not, repeat the exercise till you do. Colors that are hard to visualize are most likely the ones you need in your energy field. Again, as in exercise two, just watch the color as you breathe out. Don't control it. When it is bright and clear, move on to the next color. Now, breathe in orange as you move upward. Let it come into you from the earth up into your feet, into your hands and into you from the air all around. If you have trouble visualizing these colors in your mind, get some color samples to look at. Or it might be easier for you to do this with your eyes closed. Repeat the exercise with orange again. Continue the exercise through the following sequence of colors. Yellow, green, blue, violet and white. Make sure you see the whole egg form of your aura filled with each color before moving to the next color. These are good colors for each of the chakras. If you would like to add even higher vibrations to your aura, continue with the following colors, silver, gold, platinum, and crystalline. Then come back down to white. All colors of this second group should have an opalescent quality. Vibrating exercise for grounding. Vibrating your body means to hold your body in a position of tension that sets up involuntary physical vibrations in the body. This will increase energy flow and release blocks. These exercises are well known in core and bioenergetic therapy. So what it means is like you take your hand and you tense put tension in it, right? It starts to vibrate. You put lots of tension and it will start to vibrate and then you relax it. And again, you put the tension and then you hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it and then you relax it. So basically that's it. Tense your whole body, feel it vibrating, tense, 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 tense and then relax it. Stand with your feet parallel and shoulder width apart. After you complete the aura charging exercises given above, stand and again simply breathe out. When you go down and in when you go up, bend your knees as much as you can. Let your legs begin to feel tired. If you keep doing this long enough, your legs will begin to physically vibrate in an involuntary way. If they do not, start a vibration by quickly bouncing up and down on your heels. Allow the vibrations to work up into the upper part of your legs and your pelvis. With practice, these vibrations will spread over your whole body. This is a very good way to create a strong energy flow throughout your body. Once you get the feel of it, you can devise exercises to cause any part of your body to vibrate in order to increase the energy.
in order to increase the energy flow through that part. In this case, one usually needs the pelvis to vibrate in order to enhance the earthly energies flowing through the first and second chakras. Later, when you are in healing situation, you can slowly roll your pelvis back and forth while sitting in a sitting position. Then add a little short, fast vibration to the rolling motion. This should help the pelvis vibrate. You will feel the increased energy flow throughout your whole body. <clears throat> Sitting meditations for centering. Now sit for meditation for 10 to 15 minutes. Be sure your back is straight and comfortable. A good mantra to repeat to yourself to silence the mind for this meditation is be still and know that I am God. Simply keep your consciousness focused on that mantra. If your mind wanders, simply bring it back. Another this is normal sitting meditation with a mantra. Another good meditation is still the mind is simply counting to 10. Count 1 on the in-breath, 2 on the out-breath, 3 on the in-breath, 4 on the out-breath, until you reach 10. The hard part is that every time you allow your mind to wander and think another thought other than the counting, you go back to one and start all over again. This type of meditation really lets us know just how sloppy our minds are. Very few people can get to 10 on the first try. Now you are ready after a large glass of water to begin a day of healing. So again, you know, keeping the mind still is very, very important in any kind of meditation. But if the mind really wanders, you know, you have to try this one. It so, looks so easy, but it's actually not so easy. Caring for the healing space. It is important to work in a clean room that has been cleared of low energies, bad vibes, or dead or home energy, D-O-R, as Wilhelm Reich called it. So again, wherever you are, right, the field also needs to be cleared. That is what we found, right? If you clear the field, if you are, if you are attempting to ma uh, meditate in a contaminated field, which is depleting, meditating or getting into that state of consciousness will become difficult in that. So space also needs to be cleared. If possible, choose a room that is full of direct sunlight and has access to open air. You may also keep the room clean by smoking it in the Native American Indian tradition with sweet grass and cedar or with sage and cedar. So basically any area, any room that normally gets a lot of sunlight is in well ventilated will have generally speaking a higher energy field than a room which is closed and does not have ventilation because the energy gets stuck and it gets stale. We have to remember that all, the ultimate source of all our energy is coming from the sun. That's why sunning is very, very important. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about here is a cleaning, clearing process they use, in a, by which is used by Native Americans. They burn the sage and cedar and then they show it to all the areas in the house. It's very much like when we do the arti and we shove the arti, I mean, show the arti to all areas of the house. Or we take an agarbatti and we uh, take it around all over the house. It tends to start to clear the energetic fields in the room. Okay, but of course, we've got much more specific methods now. But yeah, this is one of the general methods. Even uh, in Bengal, we give something called dhuni in the evenings. That also will do the same thing. To smoke a room with cedar and sage, Put some dried green cedar and dried sage plant into a container and set it a fire. It is a Native American Indian tradition to use an avalon shell for the smoking so that all four elements, fire, earth, air and water, are represented. However, if you do not have an avalon shell, 
you can use a frying pan. When a large amount of the cedar and sage are burning, put out the fire. A lid works best. There will be a great deal of smoke sing, sending it into all the corners of the room. It is also a Native American Indian custom to start at the easternmost part of the house or room and cover the room in a sunrise direction clockwise. Be sure that a door is open before you start the smoking. The smoke attracts the DOR energy and carries it out the door. So again, clearing, right? So when you're clearing using smoke, you have to open the doors and windows so that then depleted energy can go out with the smoke. This is also a concept when we were doing the havans, etc. We wanted the smoke to go into all areas of our house or all areas of the factory. Again, to pick up all the depleted energy which was there and let it go out. To complete the smoking, you can give a small offering of cornmeal into the fire as a thank you. To learn more about these Native American Indian traditions, I refer you to Oshina of the Four Corners Foundation, California. Oshina, by the way, smokes each of her patients before working with them. This clears away a lot of the DOR before she starts. You can smoke yourself if you feel clogged. Some people burn Epsom salts by pouring a little alcohol over them in a saucepan and then lighting it. Using the saucepan, walk around the room, patient or yourself. Crystals sitting around the room help collect dead or gone energy. They are then cleaned by simply putting them in a bowl of one quarter teaspoon sea salt and one pint spring water to soak overnight. So again, crystals need to be cleared, right? Plus the positioning of the crystals also I have found makes a difference. Negative ion generators also help clear the room. Never work in a room without ventilation or with fluorescent lights. These lights generate a frequency that interferes with the normal pulsation of the aura, causing a beat frequency to be set up in the field. The spectral range is also unhealthy. So when, when you have a tube light, it's actually vibrating inside, right? So it will create a resonance. Now, of course, all of us use tube lights, but there are ways of blocking it off. There is also something called full spectrum light, right? Which doesn't vibrate. It's more, more like the old bulbs which are there, which give a better light uh, uh, screening to us. But naturally, nowadays, we have to take care of what we get. But yeah, jitna avoid kar sake. And the point here is, the more natural light you have in your environment, the better. The less artificial light you need to use during the day, the better. If you work in an unventilated or fluorescent lighted room, you will probably get sick. You will start accumulating DOR in your body. Your vibrations will slow down and slowly get weaker. Eventually, you will have to stop your work, probably for several months time until your energy system can clear itself out again. You may not even notice your energy frequencies decreasing because your sensitivity will decrease with them. So DOR stands for bad vibes or dead organ energy. So anything that is depleting, we need to clear. What we also find is that many times this depleted energy gets stuck on the walls and the floors of places. And that time we tell one of the cures is, uh, I mean, clean the house with salt water. But what I find with salt water is that the energy gets stuck it does not evaporate. You have to clean the salt again. So the better thing that I use is kapu, camphor. You mix the camphor in the water and use that water to clean your environment. That helps in clearing much more. Caring for the healer. If you find yourself accumulating DOR in your body, to clean your aura, take a 20-minute bath in a warm tub 
of one pound sea salt and one pound baking soda. This may make you very weak as it draws large quantities of energy out of the body. So be prepared to rest afterward to replenish yourself. Lying in the sunshine helps recharge your system. Just how long to take a sun bath entirely depends on your system. Be intuitive. Trust when your body says it has had enough. You may have to take these baths several times per week to clear yourself. One okay, so, so uh, a salt bath is a very nice thing to have. But you know, whenever we had a bath in the sea and the ocean, you'll find that you kind of tend to get very, you know, zoned out and all that when you come back, right? Because the salt, if you stay too much in it, it actually draws out a lot of energy. Yes, Sagri? Yes, uh, you mentioned using camphor uh, to swap the floors. Yeah. Uh, what about the walls and all that then? So with the walls, what we do is, we take the camphor and we you have this dhela kapoor okay not the uh, the tablets the tablets have wax in it so we want the dhela kapoor we crush it put it into a pouch kind of a thing in a potli attach it to a stick and then use that to clear it off the walls this is something that i have done many times whenever i go to a play, visit a place and there's a lot of depleted energy in that space then i tell the people wipe the walls also with kapoor Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by Dhela Kapoor? Dhela Kapoor, it looks like salt. Achha, achha. Okay. Oh, it looks like a lump, you know, and you crush it. Ah. So it will become oh. like salt. If you ah, take that it, tikya, the, the tablet wala, tikya wala Kapoor, you crush it, it's like waxy because it ah. has a little wax in it. Okay. So we want the pure Kapoor. Okay. I have no idea where you'll get it in uh, Bombay, but I think Amazon will have it. You can get it near the temples also. It comes in slabs nowadays. No, but those are those uh, thing. Uh, you know, if you go to those old shops where you get the puja ka saman, there you'll get it. Hmm. Otherwise, you're getting tablets nowadays. Hmm. To complete the smoking, you can give a small offering of cornmeal. Sorry, I turned this. Crystals sitting around the room help collect dead orgone energy. They are then cleaned by simply putting them in a bowl of one quarter teaspoon sea salt and one One should always drink a full glass of spring water after each healing. So should the patient. Running water. Okay, so this is very important, right? It, she says here spring water. So now whenever we are drinking skin uh, spring water, it is alkaline water. Most of the bottled water that we get is not alkaline. It is acidic. We did a lot of work with this when these people from Japan were here and we were testing all sorts of water. We bought all equipment also and we found that most of the water is acidic. It is not alkaline. right? So alkalizing your water and drinking it becomes very, very important. Uh, I think we will may read this book. Uh, you are you are thirsty. You are not hungry, by Doctor Batman Gillies in one of our book readings. It's very very informative about what happens when you have dehydration, and most of us are dehydrated, right? So that's why drinking a glass of water before a session and after a session becomes very very important. And this is something that we are insisting on people. I mean, we tell people whether they do it or not. We can't uh, monitor it. But we always tell people before an exercise in the Monroe programs and after the exercise, please drink a glass of water. It's extremely important for the whatever healing you've done, whatever toxicity comes out of the body, it's extremely important to flush it out. And that happens a lot with water. That means you have to need drink good water. Running water through your system helps carry away the DOR and prevents bloating. Bloating, paradoxically, is caused by not drinking enough water in the first place. Your body will retain the water in an effort to hold the DOR in the water 
rather than let it go deeper into the tissues of your body. So one of the reasons of bloating and you know water retention is actually lack of water. And I don't know, this is something that I'm having a, always I, there's a dictatomy here because most of the time these, uh, the allopathic doctors will tell you to drink less water. But one of the causes of, of the bloating and the water retention is that there is less water in the system and the body does not want to let go of the water that it has. So unless you give the body water, it will keep retaining all the water that it has. This is also seen that whenever you are in a stressful situation or you're getting stressed out, you will find that your tongue will dry. The body sucks in all the water in order to prevent the water getting lost. Right? One of the causes of asthma is also this. The body doesn't want to release water, so it will cause asthma. Right? It doesn't want the... Because we lose a lot of water vapor through our breathing process. So it wants to restrict the... Uh, uh, breathing process. That's where the body goes into asthma. So it's very important to have a lot and enough of water so that the body doesn't get into stress because of lack of water. Crystals also help protect the healer's energy system. A clear quartz or amethyst crystal can be worn over the solar plexus to strengthen your field and make it less permeable. Rosy quartz helps protect the heart when worn over the heart chakra. There is much to be said about healing with crystals. I generally use four crystals on the client in healing. In addition to the ones I wear, which are an amethyst and a rosy quartz. I put a large rosy quartz in the left hand heart meridian of the patient and a large clear quartz in the right hand. These soak up DOR that is released in the healing. I use a large amethyst with iron deposits in it on the second or first chakras to keep the patient's field pulsating strongly. The iron helps keep the patient grounded. The crystals tend to hold the patient in the body. A smoky quartz at the solar plexus is very good for this. So there's a lot of talk on crystal healing. The biggest collection of crystals I've seen is with Dr. Brian Daly. Uh, he conducts the energy medicine program at the Institute and he literally comes in with a van full of crystals. It took us like the whole day to set up all the crystals, amazing kinds of crystals he has. And then what, what we do in the healing, etc. you put the crystals on each of the chakras, you can put it on the hand, you can use it for healing like a laser beam, you know, you can use the uh, crystals for that. It's amazing. But again, you have to learn how to know and you have to be able to test and feel which crystal will work better for what. It's a full uh, study in itself. Also, what I found is that the, let's say you have an am amethyst crystal, right? Now the amethyst crystal in the shape that it is in, where it is mined from, all those factors will also start to come into the picture when we are using these crystals. If you wear a crystal, you should be sure that you wear the right one for your body. If the crystal is too strong, it will increase your field vibrations and eventually deplete your field because your basic metabolism rate will not be strong enough to keep up with the rate that the crystal induced on your field. That is, you will not be able to supply enough energy to your field to keep up the higher vibrations. You will eventually lose energy. If, however, you choose a crystal that is slightly stronger than your field, you will en then enhance your field. So it is possible for us to test which crystal will work for you. We do it for gemstones also. Which crystal will work for you and which will be beneficial to you. We can test with the uh, BG3 pendulum, we can check with the uh, Lekker antenna and it actually works because any stone can have or any crystal can have a detrimental effect on you also. So it is, ve it is well worth our while to actually check whether the crystal is working for us or not. If you wear a crystal that vibrates slower, slower than your field, it will put a drag force on your field and slow your vibrations down. 
you simply need to be aware of how each crystal affects you. As you become stronger, you will be able to wear stronger crystals. You will also need different crystals at different times of your life, depending on the circumstances. Crystals in the form of old jewels or keepsakes have imbued the energy of their former owners in them and should be thoroughly cleaned for a week in one quarter teaspoon sea salt to one quart of spring water or in ocean water. Many crystal workshops are being presented now. I suggest if you want to use crystals, attend one and learn about them before using them. Yeah, so as soon as anyone wears a crystal or holds a crystal, their vibrations can be entered into the crystal. So whenever we wear crystals, we need to clear them very, very well, right? Old jewelry. In psychometry, they have a system by, by checking into the old jewelry, they can tell you, the psychometric practitioner can actually tell you the description of every person who has ever worn those, those rings or those necklaces what was happening with them, their health situation and other situations, everything starts to get imprinted into the ring or the piece of jewelry. So whenever you use old jewelry, you should be very careful as to whose jewelry are you using, right? And also before wearing, they should normally be cleared. Now we can also check whether the jewelry is cleared or not, because if the jewelry is not cleared, then what happens is both the sides of the crystals will give a depleting effect. When the jewelry is cleared, one side gives a clear effect and the other side gives a depleting effect. The depleting effect is always there. The uplifting effect is what gets depleted when the crystal starts to absorb energy. We have seen crystals like diamonds, right? They're dull. They're absolutely dull. When we rectify them in a process by showing it to the fire, you actually see that the diamond starts to sparkle and shine, right? It gets dull because of all the depleted energy that has been absorbed into its matrix, into its uh, uh, mineral matrix. Crystals have a very, very symmetrical crystalline structure and there are gaps in the middle. That is where this energy goes and gets stuck. So when you re rectify it by putting it in salt water, putting it in the sun, showing it to the flame, etc., that energy which is stuck between the molecules of the crystal, that gets evaporated and then the crystal again starts to shine. I use a massage table and a secretary's chair when healing. This way, I do not have to stand all day and my back gets plenty of support. The weeds on the chair allow free movement. <coughs> and I can stand or sit whenever appropriate during the heal. I also use oil to anoint the feet. This helps the energy enter the body. So she is basically doing hands-on healing, right? She's touching and healing. So naturally she either has to stand or she has to sit down and put the hands wherever she is putting them. And of course, oils, aromatic oils have a beneficial effect. Aromatherapy is a totally, uh, it's a branch of uh, alternate healing in itself, right? So there's a lot of work being done with that. We have batch flower remedies. We have uh, uh, essential oil therapy. Uh, there are so many things which are available now. One of the most important things a healer needs to stay healthy is private personal time and space. This is not easy for most healers are in great demand by their patients. It is imperative that the healer be able to say, no, I need time for myself now, no matter how great the demand is. This means that when you need time, you give it to yourself, no matter what. If you do not, you will get depleted and have to stop practicing for a while anyway. Don't wait till there is nothing more to give. Rest now. Give time to your hobbies and other personal pleasures. It is very important that a healer lead a full personal life that provides for her needs. If she does not, she will eventually try to get those needs met by her patients. She will develop dependencies on her patients. 
which will then interfere with the healing process. The golden rule for the healer is first the self and what nourishes the self, then deep pause for consideration, then the nourishment of others. Healers who do not do this will eventually suffer from burnout and may risk disease from energy depletion. So again, the healer has to look after oneself, right? And needs to take care of himself or herself. It's extremely important. If you burn out, then there is nothing left to heal. Okay, now this, the next, okay, we can start it. Chapter 22, Full Spectrum Healing. An important thing to know about healing is that one heals or works on different layers of the aura in a healing and that for each layer, the work is very different from that for other layers. This will be understood more as I go into a detailed description of what takes place in a healing. The other main point is that the energies for healing do go to the fire crucible of the heart chakra for transformation from spirit to matter and from matter to spirit, as stated earlier in chapter 16. Again, healing processes at each level, at each zone will be very different from the other zones. So you have to become sensitive to that. Before you begin a session, exercises to gather energy for a day of healing. Before you begin a session with any patient, it is important to align yourself with the highest energies available and to do several of the exercises given in the last chapter to clear and charge all your chakras to allow the energy to come into your field. Do these meditation exercises for several months until you are comfortable with them. Before you begin a day of healings, it is very important for you to gather energy and focus on your purposes. Meditate the evening before or the morning of the healing day. Allow one minute per patient. Hold your mind completely blank while drawing in energy for one minute for each patient. Another technique is to focus your mind without other thoughts on each patient while drawing in energy. Again, Concentration time is one minute per patient. Visualize or feel energy flowing into you. You also need to have lots of experience in discernment, which is discussed in chapter 19. Be sure you're supported by a few friends who are experienced in these matters. These two things, discernment and support, are not electives but prerequisites for anyone who wants to be a channel during healing. This is very profound work and should never be taken lightly or as a party game. Okay, so this is important, right? So, <clears throat> again, you can actually focus and intuitively get what you're dealing with with each, each patient. Many times what happens is the patient will come and tell you something, but the issue lies somewhere else totally. So your intuitive ability is to tune into the system of the patient becomes very important if you really want to become a good healer, right? The other thing is that many times, you know, we play the fool with these things. We don't give it the required, uh, uh, what do you call it, the required uh, uh, importance, so as to say, right? And we start playing around with it that can actually become a big problem because if people start to, you know, they start to reject it or they, they start to abuse it or whatever, then it becomes a huge problem. So you have to have respect for yourself and respect for the healing uh, process that you are actually using. This use of these techniques can and often does lead to very unpleasant experiences which have the possibility of causing harm to the person trying to channel without the appropriate spiritual discipline. Channeling is actually a byproduct of spiritual discipline. Once these requirements are fulfilled, 
one can proceed with the exercise to let the guides come into your field, given later in this chapter. For now, do exercises in chapter 21 before meeting with your patient. So again, when we are open, we are in stillness, we are in oneness, we are in equanimity, we are centered, we open ourselves for the energies which are there existing in different spectrum levels to come into our system and to allow them to use our physical body and our auric field to do the healing. And it works very well. We have a lot of recording. There was a group of people who were called the explorers, uh, which happened in uh, uh, with the Robert Monroe at the Institute. And there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of recordings of sessions where actually entities come in and they heal and they use the bodies of the uh, person to do stuff, right? In, the, in fact, in the Gateway Voyage, we have something, we hear something called the Patrick Tape, uh, which is very, very interesting. I think most people who've got, who've heard that track will be amazed that this kind of a thing can also happen. So we have to clear ourselves and to allow the energies to come into our system to work through us. After greeting your patient, be sure to describe briefly what you will be doing if the person has not worked with you before. It is important that the healer communicate as much as possible in the patient's language. Be as simple as possible. If you so now, now this is very important, right? Communicating with your patient. So what are you getting when you talk to the patient and the patient tends to understand what you're saying it allows for the blocks. I said by supporting. No, I need. It allows for the blocks, etc., which are there in the energy system of the patient to start to dissolve because an understanding starts to take place. This is something that we see all the time in biofield tuning. If the patient understands what you are saying and gets it, the energy block immediately dissolves. If you discover the patient already uh, Rita ji, Rita Berry ji, you're you're getting unmuted all the time. If you discover the patient already understands a lot regarding the aura and healing, then talk at that level of understanding. Quickly determine the general level of understanding about healing and the aura to establish common ground for communication. This will set the patient at ease so you can begin work. So again, you have to communicate at the level of at the level at which the patient is. Now, if I'm talking to a child, I'll talk in a very different way than if I'm talking to a normal grown-up adult, right? If I'm talking to an elderly person, I will talk totally differently because everyone has their own setup. Everyone has their own way of understanding. Everyone has their own way of doing things. So you have to adjust what you're doing to whatever the patient is thinking about and looking at. In a healing session, I usually work with the lower auric bodies first and then move on to the higher bodies. A brief outline of the healing sequence given in figure 20 to 1 may be useful as you follow the detailed description below. Healing sequence 1. General analysis of the patient's energy system. 2. Alignment of the three energy systems to be used in the healing, that of the healer, patient and guides and the universal energy field. So this is very important, right? If there is no resonance between the healer and the healy and guidance is not coming as to what to do, then of course the healing may not be very successful. Three. Healing the lower four bodies, first, second, and third, and fourth layers of the aura. A. Chelation, charging and clearing the patient's aura. 
B. Spine cleaning. C. Cleansing specific areas of the patient's aura. 4. Healing the etheric template, spiritual surgery, fifth layer of aura. 5. Healing the ketric, seventh layer of aura template, restructuring. A. Ketric template organ restructuring. B. Ketric template chakra restructuring. So every organ is also there in all the levels of the aura, right? So if there is a problem in a specific layer of the aura and you are attempting to heal it in another layer, what the result that you are wanting, will you will not get. Six. Healing of the celestial level, sixth layer of aura. Seven. Healing from the cosmic level, eighth and ninth layers of aura. Do you want to do this just now? Or? I think we can stop.